Hello. When Sue Diane came out to do a workshop for the Blackstone Valley Art Association, she started out by giving individual instructions to each of us at our desk to get us started. So I'm going to summarize that part and then we'll go into her full workshop where she then addresses all of us as a group and helps us with things. So she first began by talking about how colors have hues and that's the red and yellow and blue and other colors that we tend to know about. And there are primary colors, which are the red and yellow and blue. And then there's other combinations of secondary colors, which are the things that you mix together to get the green and orange and purple and analogous colors, which are next to each other and so on. So those are the hues of the color. And if you look at this color hue chart that she brought with her, you can see the same sort of thing, that there are the primary colors of yellow, blue, and red. And if you mix together yellow and red, you get orange. If you mix together yellow and blue, you get green. And if you mix together blue and red, you get purple. So all of these kinds of thoughts, which many painters and other kinds of artists get to know, are about the hues of the colors. What Sue was talking with us in this workshop is to learn more about color chroma. This is the dulling down of a color by adding its complement or its opposite. So if you start with a bright yellow out of the tube, you'll want to dull it down a bit for many ways that you use it on your canvas or on your paper. And the same thing with red. You might want a super bright red for something that's in the foreground, but if a barn is off in the distance, it's not going to be that same bright red because colors tend to get muted as they fade into the distance. So you would want to mute it down with its opposite, which would be green. So to learn how to do this, we all started by making ourselves a color wheel, and I'll have a link to this in the description. You just need a series of circles, one, two, three, four circles with some lines, and they don't have to be exact or the right exact shape or anything like that. The idea is just to have the circles and to label them with these color names around the outside, and I'll give you the template. And we started in this workshop by putting in just from our tubes or from our colored pencils or whatever we're using, the primary yellow, the primary blue and the primary red in those three specific wedges that you can see. And this works for all different types of art, acrylics, oils, watercolors, colored pencils, you name it. Next, we mix together our yellow and blue to put in a green, our blue and red to put in a purple, and our red and yellow to put in an orange. So we're starting to learn about mixing colors in here from the main primary colors that we have as the starting points in our sets. Next, we mixed in the middle colors. So we mixed green and yellow to make yellow green, yellow and orange to make yellow orange, <laughs> orange and red to make red orange, and I think you get the sense here. So in each of the empty wedges, we mixed the two neighbor colors together to get that middle color, and this created the outer wheel of hues. But next, we were going to go a step further and now look at the chroma levels. So then we took the primary yellow and we mixed a little, little of its opposite, the purple on the opposite end of the wheel. And that dulled down the yellow a little. And what we didn't do it in the workshop because there was only so much time in the workshop, but the end, the aim <laughs> is to then, for each of these wedges, to mix in a little of the opposite color. For, so for orange, for the next wedge down, we'd mix in a little blue. For red, for the next wedge down, we mix in a little green and so on. And everything becomes duller and duller as it heads toward the center. And you want to do that in your paintings as you head into the distance to mute down the colors a little bit. The second project she had us do involved this template. And again, I'll, I'll put a link to it so that you can copy this onto your own canvas or paper or whatever you tend to use. And we would put a primary color into the leftmost square of each triad. So the red, the yellow, and the blue. And in the square to the right of that primary color, we'd mix the other two primary colors. So we'd put in green, which is yellow and blue, next to the red. We'd put purple, which is red and blue, next to the yellow. And we'd put in orange, which is red and yellow, next to the blue. So we'd end up with this grid being filled in with a primary color in each of the top left of the three, and then the matching complementary color in the next right of each of those three. So once they look like this, then we mix together the red and the green to make a gray out of those two, the yellow and the purple to make a gray out of those two, and the blue and the orange to mix the gray out of those two. And the aim here is to make a different set of grays to learn how those grays can then work in our painting. Because if you just went out and bought a gray, it might not relate at all to the kinds of colors that you're using in your painting. So if you learn to make your own greens and purples and oranges, and then learn to make your own grays, 
out of the palettes that you always work with, then this is going to make a much more coherent and cohesive set of painting for everything that you work on. So print out the two templates, the color wheel and then this trio of squares, and get those ready onto whatever kind of paper you like to work on. And now Sue will walk us through how to fill these in. Yes. So now that you've done such a wonderful job transferring this pattern, I'd like you to turn that piece of paper over. I mean, this piece of paper, the watercolor paper. Just flip it over. Just. Yeah. Because <clears throat> I'm going to have you do a couple of different things on the back okay. before you get around to the front. But there's no rush. So those. Does anybody here not know me? Well, I kind of know. Okay, cool. Super. Do you what? Not, not know who I am. Who me? Who me? Because you weren't <laughs> expecting me this evening. So I kind of was a stand-in. Um, my name is Sue Dion. I live here in Uxbridge. I used to have a studio over in the Burnett Mill back in the old and olden days before it burned down. Um, I have a frame shop over on Quaker Highway. Picture framing. And I teach people how to paint. Primarily in watercolor, but I also work in acrylic and oil. <coughs> yes, darling. Hey, question: Can you uh, give a class on framing? I could. Didn't I? I did. Yes. Not too long Have ago. You? Oh. We focused on matting. I just joined last month. Damn it! Well, we can do it again and again. I'm sorry. My apologies. Are we recording? Am I live? Yeah. Yeah. Am I being censored? <laughs> You're being recorded. I need a censor person. <laughs> I, I can bleep you. Leave me out. I don't want you to have to take all that time. Whenever I, I teach a lot online, I did especially during COVID. And um, I would edit back through to take people's faces out, right? And to remove, uh, so, uh, so, I mean, that's 60% of what I said were those two words. So anyway, see, there I go again. It's a, it's a verbal tip. So I was looking forward to this evening's. I was going to attend to learn about light and color with pastel. Because as I mentioned, I paint with watercolor, acrylic, and oil, but I also own pastels. And I just never get around to using them. And I thought, well, maybe this will inspire me. And maybe if I understand what I'm doing, I'll actually use them occasionally. <laughs> but that was not meant to be. So I came to talk to you a little bit about what I know about color and what I'm learning about color. I think that's one of the wonderful things about art is that we never stop learning, which is really wonderful. Um, and what I'm going to be sharing with you, I want you to jot this down. It's based on a presentation by the owner of Gamblin Oil Paints. And if you Google navigating color space, NAV navigating, navigating color space, navigating, navigating color space. And he talks about, it's a wonderful video. It's about 20 minutes long. And he talks about color and our understanding of color. Do I need to split you two up? <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. We're so, buddies uh, already. <laughs> that's great. You'll be good friends. Color wheel. Most of us are pretty familiar with it, right? Okay. There are certain relationships between the colors on the color wheel that are important to know. And we use these colors to create our compositions. And if we use the colors wisely, we create more pleasing compositions. One of the ways to do that is to use analogous colors. Those are the colors that sit beside one another. That's always a nice, pleasing composition. Complementary colors are colors that live across the color wheel from one another. And they look very nice beside one another. But when you're a painter and you blend two complementary colors, what happens? They dull it down. They negate one another. Yeah, we call it mud. <coughs> I live there. I live in the world of mud. That's I like it. I yeah, <laughs> exactly. I enjoy muting my colors. I personally feel that the colors that come out of your tube were never intended to go onto your canvas or your watercolor paper. They're just too, they're too <clears throat> jarring. We need to understand how to work our colors a little bit so that we can make them look more pleasing together. That's my thoughts. So we know that when we take blue and yellow and mix them together, we'll get some form of green, right? Combining our colors. We understand 
pretty well, I think, color temperature, whether that color is leaning toward warm or leaning toward cool. But do we ever think of color as value? That's the missing piece for a lot of people. We don't understand that third dimension of color, which is value. On your color wheel, if it were three-dimensional, the colors that are out near the outside edge of your color wheel tend to be more saturated, highly chromatic. What's the definition of chroma? Does anybody know, like, specifically? No. Intense okay. color, though. I think it means intense color. Yeah. Okay. So this is more a rendering of a like a three-dimensional color wheel, where the colors that live outside here, these are mostly our modern pigments, and they have very high saturation. They're really intense, they're really bright, and they're made in laps. In around the middle are the colors that the Renaissance painters got to paint with, the Impressionists, right? During the time of Renaissance, they got <coughs> all this equipment they could make pigments for the artists. So they had a wonderful array of colors to use, but they weren't so highly saturated. In near the middle is where you find the colors that the masters were using. Masters did not have that much um, availability to these chromas, to these high value pigments or highly saturated pigments. So they really counted on value to make their paintings work. Hello. So, that's kind of the idea I wanted to introduce to you today. Now, it doesn't matter if you're working in watercolor, acrylic, oil, colored pencil, pastel, lovely, right? They're, it's going to work the same way. And I always encourage my students to create a color wheel from the pigments in their palette. What good does it do you to go out and buy a color wheel with colors that you don't own, <laughs> right? So this red and that green will make this gray. I don't have that red or that green, but I have these colors, and I want to know what's going to happen with these colors. So that's why tonight, if you have your materials with me, use whatever materials you have. If you aren't very familiar with the color wheel, I have a few of these. You're welcome to take one. It talks about some of the color relationships. Um, I have you write down navigating color space. Hi, how are you? Would you like to play? Yeah, I have, I have, it. I got I have more I gave tools. Her oh, well, I have another one. I've got plenty. Do you want some graphite? Um, yeah, okay. So. Interesting thing about pigments, in case you weren't aware. Who in here paints with watercolor? What happens to watercolor pigments when they dry? They fade. They, fade. they get lighter, right? Anybody in here work with acrylic? What happens to acrylic paints when they dry? They get brighter. They get darker. Yeah. Darker. Duller. I can't tell you how many times my gallery, or a gallery that I work with, has sent paintings back to these are too dark. I put them in a customer's house and it's like, really? I had no idea. But my studio has <laughs> lots of lights and three skylights. My eye and my brain were adjusting my values for the light that was in my studio. My studio was too bright. So if you're finding your paintings are too dark, take a look at what kind of light you're working under. But you should all have something like this in your possession. It's a value card. If you take your acrylic or your oil paint, I think maybe that's why people like oil so much, because it, maybe it stays true. I just get uncoordinated when I take the cap off a tube of oil and it goes, it's everywhere. <laughs> so it's really bad. So it's really bad. I don't know why it is. but So basically, if you look at that red through this card, you can begin to identify the value of your pigment. If you squint and you look, and that red kind of disappears, then you know that's a value 10. Is it the darkest one? Yeah. It's, I wish it would be more consistent, but I think white is the lightest and 10 is the darkest. So anyway, I would, I would challenge you to create a little card similar to this one. What I've done is I've listed out all of the colors in my palette. Actually, I have more than one palette. <laughs> it's really bad. Like you take a class with somebody and it's like you love their work so you have to buy their paints because that will make you paint like them. It never works, but I keep doing it. I must have three or four palettes. So 
I put a bar of, oh, what's that? Sharpie? Yeah. And that, when I draw my paint across, it helps me to see which of my pigments are more opaque and which are more transparent. <clears throat> and it's hard to see, but if you look at it closely, my cadmium, your cadmiums are always going to be more opaque. It sits on top of that black, where the more transparent colors, alizarin crimson's quite transparent, it just kind of disappears. Also, if you're working with watercolor, you can come back and lift after your pigments have dried to see how staining that pigment is. Understanding the opacity and transparency of your pigments and their staining qualities can really help you to be more successful with your paintings. So, you just list down the colors that are on your palette. You put a band of black in, if you remember, if you forget, oh well, do it again, right? Another thing you can do with watercolor is you could kind of see how far you can stretch that color out. Yellow is the weakest color in the spectrum. That's why we have that expression, yellow belly, right? And you cannot get a band of yellow to shift in value that, that far. It's just a very short spectrum. Blue has a very long spectrum. So you can really stretch out the values from that tube of blue. Because as watercolors, we don't typically use the color white to tint our colors. We just use more water and let the white of the paper lighten the pigment. So, yeah, start thinking about your colors as values. They have an inherent value. And if you squint and look at this color wheel, certain things will blend together and certain things will pop out, right? Another tool to help you see value is something like this. They come in red and they come in green. And if you look at your painting through this, it will negate the colors. I'm gonna pass it around, take a look at the work on the walls. You might have to get up to reach each other, but if you haven't seen one, <clears throat> those can be really helpful. Of course, now we all have cell phones. I am constantly snapping pictures of my paintings and switching it down to mono or grayscale. Because if your painting works in value with black and white, then it's a successful painting. You cannot describe things using color and expect someone to understand it when they get more than eight feet away from your painting. So we need to really focus on our values. So, did anything I said confuse you? Yeah. All right. Does anyone have any questions I could try to answer? <coughs> Well, what I tried to do with um, my watercolors, you know, with opaque or translucent, I was looking each one of them up and I just did a list and I wrote translucent, opaque. You can. That's how I was. Depressed. There's a wonderful resource called the Wilcox Book of Watercolor Pigments. Wilcox, Stephen Wilcox, I think, wrote it. It's a tome. It's this. And the interesting thing yeah, is, if you go in there and you look up um, you permanent rose or you look up a particular so hue, You'll see a range of colors, and that's why it can be so challenging to create a color because whether Holbang made it or Winsor and Newton or Da Vinci, it's not going to be the exact same hue. So yeah, Wilcox Guide to Watercolor Pigments. You'll love it, and he actually has a smaller one, uh, a color mixing book. Much more, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping. This is a great thing to take to bed with you. One or two chapters done. <laughs> he also he also wrote a really wonderful book called um, Blue and Yellow Don't Make Green, or Yellow and Blue Don't Make Green. Um, sure they do. They actually don't, because what actually happens is the yellow and the blue are canceling one another out. And it's what's left behind that we're seeing. So it's not that we're adding blue and yellow to create green. It's when we combine those two colors, they're negating certain properties, and the green is what's left. I think that's the premise of the book. That'll help you sleep, too. No, I'm kidding. It's a really good book. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is I would like you to use the paper that you have with the colors on it, if you have them. I want you to start with your purest pigments right out along the outside edge. And then I want you to see if you can work your way through to the center. The key here is 
if we could get everything in this second channel to be the same value, so that when I squint and look at it, I don't get a, is it possible? Is it possible with yellow? Can I make my yellow here be as dark as that blue? I don't know. It's a challenge. It doesn't mean it's possible. So, the colors so it goes from dark to light as it goes it's in. It's going to go from bright to dull. OK. So One, two, we're just going to start by working around the outside of the wheel. Fill it in with your pure pigments. And it's listed there for you, whether it's yellow or whether it's, I usually put yellow at the top of my wheel. Can we see those things? Oh, what happened to our papers? Primary yellow. Here you go. Okay. Oh, okay. So you're going to fill in your three primaries first. Why don't we start with that? For your primary yellow, mm -hmm. um, cadmium yellow light is a really Which nice primary, primary yellow. I think Hansa That's yellow, it. I think I use that sometimes. It seems to be the same thing to me. <laughs> Does anyone oh, need one. paint? Yeah. I have yeah. some. Yeah. 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 Like yellow, yellow. Oh. Lemon yellow. Is Lemon yellow would be great. Yeah. yeah. It's nice and bright. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, I think that's it. Who needs paints? I've got some I'll, here. I'll try paint rather than pencils. It's harder to get values with the colored pencils. All right, so we're just putting yellow in the top spot. Yep. Just grabbing the brush. Oh, you need a brush? You can try your finger. We have brushes if she doesn't have them. Oh, thank you. This is going to be harder to do this with I don't know. I'm not that experienced with pencils. It seems like it would be. Yellow, red, and blue. Those are your three primary colors. See if you can find the spots. They should be evenly spaced on there. Now for this yellow, you want us to go all the way down? No, I just want you to do the outer ring. Okay. These are our high chroma, beautiful, saturated, okay. luscious, yellow. bright color. Pure Very color yellow. out on the outside edge of that color wheel. By the way, if you are interested in learning more about color, this book. If you've never seen it, I brought it in so you could take a look at it. One, two, it's the three, Munsell color four. system. And he actually has, they have all these little things that you poke out and you put onto the pages. It's a big study. It will take you hours to complete it. But by the time you're done, you will understand color forward, backwards, upside down. And wow. you can look at a color and you will be able to tell me what its value is, what its hue is. All kinds of interesting, fascinating things. I'm just pleased that I can look at a color and tell you what color it is. So, but if you'd like to take a look at that, you're welcome to. Let's see, now this is a blue red. So primary red is not the color of a fire truck. Primary red is that pinky color. It's the what color? Pinky That's color. Orange. <laughs> is it orange? And you can find it in tubes now called permanent magenta, I'm sorry, primary magenta or permanent rose. And that is your pure primary. You know what? If you've got a box of cereal at home, when you take it apart to put it in the recycling bin, grab the bottom. There'll be a little thing, your printmaker's colors. There'll be this greenish blue, this bright yellow, and this pinky red. Those are your primary colors. Oh, wow. Those oh, are the wow. three colors that the printmaker uses to create all of the colors on the packaging. So then it goes... Cyan, <laughs> magenta, one yellow. Three, four. One more of those? Yeah. I don't Do you have? I have one. To transfer? Uh, mm -hmm. No, just to okay. read. Okay, so after the red. What is it say? All right, once you've done your red, your yellow, and your blue, then I want you to skip to the middle sections. So you're going to take this color, combine it with this color. It goes here, but I don't want it to look like either of its parents. It has to be its own, and unlike so when we have children, day? I would like yellow. you to combine this blue and this yellow. Give me a green okay. that doesn't look like either of them. Then one, two, one, two. Yeah. So you can use green, you can use violet, you can do orange. But what I want you to do is mix these two colors. We'll go in the middle. 
Okay. But they shouldn't look too much like the red or too like there. So blue and red oh. make purple. They make a violet. Yep. Oh, I see. Oh, make purple. Yep. Oh. Hello. Hey. hey, Carol. Hello. How are you? Good. So once you've got your primary red, yellow, and blue. Yeah, that looks nice. Perfect. Yep. So I want you to put in your primaries first. Red, yeah. yellow, blue. Okay. Okay. I don't I don't want to have a ticket with a ruler, but I brought one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, one. Should we do green? One, two, you can. Four, five. Try and find me a green that doesn't look like either of its parents. Oh. All right, so we're making the green. Okay. Yes. And after green? <coughs> Violet or orange? So you can mix this red and that yellow and fill this one. As orange. Yep. Okay. Now you might think to yourself, I want it, it's yellow and red, so I'm going to take half yellow, half red. But what did I say about yellow earlier? It's weak. You're going to need way more yellow than you will red to make an orange that doesn't look like either of those. Oh, I get it. Yeah. What's the goal? To get this color? So the watercolor paper that you're working on tonight is Fabriano. And I like Fabriano paper a lot, but this is Fabriano studio paper. It's a lot less expensive and it's not nearly as good, but it's great for an exercise like this. But it may not give you the what you're looking for if you want to do a finished painting. Oh, but you can buy 10 sheets of it for like $18. Oh, wow. So it's pretty reasonable. So if you're looking for stuff to practice on or to test colors, or it's called Fabriano Studio Paper. <coughs> All right, so you've got your primaries and your secondaries. Yep. Perfect. Now, yes. secondary. I'm a This is why it's so important that you're going to be pretty much either way. Because you've got to break it down even further. No, it's there. That's a good one. There's an orange, is it? Yep, uh -huh. that's all right. Something that, a red orange. Yep, a red orange. Now it's yellow and green. So, yes, I have a course starting April 29th on painting abstract expressionistic flowers. I know. <laughs> I know. It meets for five weeks, it meets on Saturdays for two hours. So, so can can I color. so can I buy the rights to it to watch them <laughs> on my own time? Um, this one you cannot. Um, you have access to it, I think, for a month after the class ends, because I'm teaching for someone else. Oh. So at this point in time, you know what? Though I just taught one recently for myself that I, I have the recordings of. One of these days I'll get all those recordings edited and get them out there for you guys. But I'm also um, doing a mentorship, which is really fun, Anne, after our experience. Um, so the company is called Mastery Us, and they believe there is mastery in all of us. <laughs> so that's where they got their name from. Helps me remember how to say it. And they're just, they're really nice people. They're in Western Canada. Oh, now we're filling in the in-between okay. ones? Yes. Yeah. With whatever they were? So you started with your three primary colors. Okay. And then you combined those and you created your three secondaries. Mm -hmm. And now you need to do your intermediaries. Do we have a purple? So to create no, our you secondaries, gotta, you have to make one because that one is that one is yeah. it, this one's closer. It's okay. closer. Oh, I've yeah, got it's some closer, purple. I can get you some. Then red, Hold on a second. Let me grab a brush. Mm. So you want us to mix our purple then with our red? Then go to the purple and red. Right there. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Great. Now you're going to do your intermediary colors. They need to. Yep. Exactly. And you want it again. You want to create a color that doesn't look too much like either one. Bent. 
That's really messy. <laughs> and I don't even really watercolor either. I just. Yeah, yeah. It came in with some pieces. Salem's Cross. Salem's Cross. Yeah, they're, well, they're much thicker, I guess. Yeah, they're all over the place. 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 Watercolor, perfect. Now I need oh, green. Look, you got that perfectly. Yeah. More watercolor. So easy. <clears throat> but it's a fun I project. Do. I don't know if Little I got watercolors. That one. You're a master. <laughs> More watercolors. Right, we got they, acrylics. They would, they would sneak in. Sneak the. Sneak in, into the, the, the area okay. of the thing and listen yeah. to So, the what I want you to do is see if on the back of your paper, if you can reproduce this color. Where? Oh, on the back of my paper. Oh, yeah, I just gotta wait that for that to dry a little bit. Watch it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, See, to me, that's orange. Yep, that looks orange. Orange to me. Yeah, but this one is that orange. What? Maybe it's a red. An orange and a red. <laughs> it's like when you have the lighter color, you need more of it when you're blending. Right? That's very true. Yeah. Absolutely. It gets I, I know you had said that. Quickly. Yes. It's my first time doing watercolors ever. It's kind of the color on my shirt. I was mixing the colors in the palette instead of doing it to the paper. I do that too. I do it both ways. Yep. It's I didn't all clean good. it off. You had to wash it all off. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Okay. So I want to use. Okay. So. We're going to take complements and we're going to combine them to create neutrals. So I want to fill that one red, that one yellow, and that one blue. <coughs> so here's the graph. Two complements create a neutral. They will all come together. Okay. Now, you need the complements for red. Do you have to know what that is? Uh, complement green. Mm -hmm. Hebert's okay. candy. Well, we're going to do on the back yeah. now. It's like behind it. Is, like if you take that right, red, right after it. Yellow, blue, and their complements green, violet, and orange. Is that always have to be? You're going to do, you're going to draw those boxes on the back of your paper. On oh, the back. does it have to be? Okay. Or do you have another piece of paper you can use? Yeah. Oh, cool. I can just. <laughs> there you go. Am I, am I going to go from here so to here? Red and green one? makes no. mud. No, good thought though. <laughs> so what you're going to do is you're going to use the complement of red. If you go across the cover wheel from red, I like the one with those things. So we're going to make something like this. We're doing complementary pairs here. Oh, okay. So you can color that one in green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Mixing, right? Okay. Yeah, or you can use one of these, or you can mix it. It doesn't matter. I, 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 that one. It's kind of nice. It's green. Red so and green makes this yeah. one. I thought we were going to do some more mixing. No, we, get to the no, we will be in a moment. What do you call it? The complement. Complement. Right here. <laughs> Two colors that live across the color wheel from each other are complement. Okay. Which means they look one of them. Nice. They look nice. They complement each other. But if you push them together, they will negate one another, which is <clears> the complement to yellow is. Posing the person against the background, they probably know they're in a red dress. Sure, you can. This is me trying to erase Prussian blue when I should have used ultramarine. See, it's an adventure. See, that's looking very pretty. You see how the colors sort of merge into each other? 
What are those are actually red and tertiaries, oh. and they color? should be oh. a color. That one's fine, too. Mm -hmm. That's kind um, of what you're This one's violet. So, yep. that one's right there. The, the you need the color that you would I'll put there you is kind of a mixture of the violet and the red. I know. Red, violet. Yep, so, yeah, exactly. So you mix those two together, and then you put that into the thing that's the mixture of the two. I think of the holidays, Christmas and Easter. Oh, you did? The orange. So it is Let try it again. Red and green. So we're making tertiaries. So now you want to find the complements to each of your primaries. Oh, And there's a couple of ways you can do that. See, we're encouraging people to try new things. Happy mistakes. Yes, exactly. You have a nice color. Thank you. See? Yeah. Thank you for doing okay. Oh, very nice. But there's another way to figure it out. You've got three primaries, right? Okay, turn it back over. So if you're using red, what are the two primaries that you're missing? Yellow and blue. What do they make? That's the complement to red. So here you've got yellow, but you're missing what two primaries? Oh, this green, looks like violet. okra. <laughs> blue, you so you can make us hungry. <laughs> no, the color okra in my palette. So this you don't have to have a color wheel to look and find the primary. That's a, it's almost a brown. Right. Did you know that brown is technically an orange? An online class Is it really? Yes. Well, the color family of orange. And, and there it is. Um, right. It was from Kelly. So, oh, so and why would you want to know? Why would you want to create those colors? Well, try this. As things move away from us, they get cooler. They get, there's less contrast. They get duller, right? So say you're doing a landscape and there's a barn at the back end of the field. You know the barn is red, but if you paint it red, it's going to come forward in your painting. How can I still paint that red and make it sit back? Aha! Are you done with the cypherine? That's the key. That's why it is. That's why it matters to know your yeah. You know what? Maybe that's my problem. Because I have no make, depth to mine. Right. You can still make that barn red, but it's a dough. It sets back. Because you dulled it with its complement. Is it a dull green? You're, you're a green theology. Your grass back there will be a hell of a lot duller than it will be in the foreground, too. So you'll put a little red in the grass. You'll put a little dull green for background. Okay. And what that does is it makes them closer together. There's less contrast. As things move away from us, they have less contrast. So, so you would like paint this as further away and totally start adding more green to it as you came up to the front of the picture. So like this Brighter, more intense. Also, what about when I'm doing a painting and I want to put some gray into it? Do I run out of buy a tube of paint gray? No. Which gray do I want to buy? Well, what are the two primary colors in my painting? What's my primary color? If it's blue, I'll make a gray by adding orange to my blue, because now my blue and my gray are going to work together, right? So now you can make your own grays. Or browns. Or browns. Which we just did. Right. Absolutely. And it's kind of funny, because you guys know you used all the same colors. Why didn't you get three squares that are the same? And they're... Because you're combining one primary and one secondary. One is dominant. So you've got 100% of blue, but you've only got 50% of red and yellow. Not even. You've got way lower. But you know, you know what I'm saying? So they're all going to have slightly different hues. Purple This was fun. It's pretty interesting when you can use your color and understand how to use your color. Now your goal is to fill that color wheel, dull those colors down with their complements in toward the middle.
fill in those inner bands. Take that orange, dull it with just the slightest bit of your blue, and go into that second band. Then take your blue, dull it with a little bit of the orange, and bring your colors into the center, and you'll see how the colors in your palette work. Okay, so with this orange, I'm going to be adding... A lot of purple. Well, that's that's its complement. That's what you have across the field. Right. So a little, and then more, and then more, more of this. Yep. And then the. And then for this one is a little orange and a little more orange. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That is cool. Orange. Well, that's the beauty of using your colors to create the color wheel, because then you know what your color wheel is. Yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. So now, what are you supposed to be doing? You're trying now to find this again. This. This little squash here. And it just doesn't have the same saturation. That's all. So that's better. And then we're going to add more orange to it. I keep this little tape measure. This has more steps, but you can see how it goes from that bright color to the dull color. That's the whole idea. So, yeah, just two minutes. So, the takeaway from this is you can dull it by adding the complement. It was interesting. The complement is the color. Why would you want to make these are the they, they are. <laughs> they are. They're called tertiary. They don't really have I, a name. I, I, I got this. I got this acrylic at home. <laughs> I think it's so you can turn over your little cards now if you want to. Your challenge is to see if you can create that color. Oh, gee. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look what I got. Wow. Look at me. Studio perfect. Oh, that's all. What's happening is hard to make it. No. Okay, guys, let me interrupt you for just a minute. Because I have to go soon. I want to explain. I want to explain, Lucy. You've got some explaining to do. We work with subtractive color theory. Our primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. If we combine red, yellow, and blue, we will ultimately get black. Ever see a um, CMYK file on your computer, an image, dot CMYK? Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Those are meant to be printed. An RGB file, you've seen those, right? Dot RGB, if you look, you'll see it when you see an image on the computer. Things that are generated by light have a different primary color system. It's red, green, and blue. And that's anything you would see on your television, on your phone, anything that's generated by light. If you take the three primaries of additive color theory, red, green, and blue, and add them, you will get white. I know, it's a little bit like quantum physics. It's like, what? Right? <laughs> But just remember that as you're adding your complements, you are dulling your colors back. Also remember, when you're painting from something on a computer screen, you're not going to be able to reproduce that because you're using subtractive color theory. Okay? Just keep it in mind. You'll go crazy trying to make that beautiful glowing painting with your paints. It's a different color system. So if you print that picture. Then you can work from the print. Even if you do it on your computer at home? I mean your... The colors will probably suck, but yeah, you can do it. <laughs> but no, absolutely. You're going to edit this film, right? I'm going to edit that. She's taking out all my swearing and my uh and my so. So, <laughs> I want to thank you for having me tonight. It was really fun. Thank this was you. fun. Um, check out that, that oh, little perfect. thing. Yep. And um, just use the colors you have and understand the colors you have. And don't feel like you have to go out and buy that color. Right. And it is different, not wrong. You know, oh, just get past it has to be this specific thing. It's different. That's all.
that was a lot of fun. I oh, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah. I'm glad you made it. Thank, Thank you so much, Sue, for stepping in at the last minute. And you are very welcome. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. It was great to see you all. Thank you. Oh, my oh, sketchbook. Oh, it's a green. Yeah. I take. All right, I'm leaving you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh my God. You've been around with guess green. <laughs> No, I'm six. not a circle. <laughs> no, I didn't want to waste the paint. I'm putting the primer on it. Okay. Okay. Oh, did you want to see this? No, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> that. I'm originally from Ooh. upstate New York. Oh, very cool. I'm from Troy. Oh, Herkimer. Oh, <laughs> that came up. Isn't that pretty? I, yeah, it was good. You want to see the And there's my other side. Oh, excellent. I got all those nice browns. <laughs> okay, guys. Take a picture of this before you go. This is your goal with that color wheel. You're trying to negate. You want high chroma, and you want. We still taping? Negative chroma. She is. <laughs> Negative chroma. That's my own little special saying. I gotta go. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.